So last Wednesday, we, um, after the Zoom session, uh, a woman stayed on and talked about her recent year where she feels her friends have gotten a bit worried about her. She takes long walks, wants to hang out a good deal less. But just this sense of a deeper peace growing in her life and always also though a sense of disorientation with the old structures and relationships falling away. And this sense of what does one do when you're standing at the threshold and don't quite know what the next step is and don't quite understand what the Dhamma wants of you. And I think this is something a lot of us have moved through is like Plato's prisoner, understanding that the shadows on the cave wall are just shadows and our eyes are no longer carried by them. But the time it takes to turn your head towards a growing light in the periphery and walk towards that greater sun and how that light tends to blind us at first and how the world does not understand what we're walking towards. There's a sutta called the contemplation of dyads where the Buddha says that what the noble ones consider true, the world considers false. What the noble ones consider pleasure, the world considers pain. And where he also talks about how the heart taken out of Mars stream of sensuality uh, flops around like a fish on the shore. One has given up so many of the old roots we've had towards nourishment of the mind, of the heart, of entertainment. But there's a time before something comes to replace that where we find ourselves standing in a dark room, wondering when the light will become bright. And Longpore Amaro uh, once had a nimitta, a vision, or I think a dream, where this wonderful teacher named Master Hua, who was the founder of City of 10,000 Buddhas, came to him and said, bright, loud, and mobile is the false. Subtle and indistinct is the true. Bright, loud, and mobile is the false. Subtle and indistinct is the true. And just the time it takes to let our vision clear from the bright neon flashing that's so bound our gaze for decades or lifetimes and begin to intuit a softer light, the dappling of sun through maple leaves, the uh, sound of bird song and to also oh and I, I know I've quoted this poem before by T.S. Eliot but uh, it's from the four quartets and he says um, you are not ready for hope for hope would be hope for the wrong thing you are not ready for love for love would be love of the wrong thing. There's still yet faith, but the faith and the hope and the love are all in the waiting. But the faith and the hope and the love are all in the waiting. And yet this kind of blaze of intuition of seeing something true, of encountering the Dhamma for the first time, it's the most profound moment in a life I've ever seen. For me, it came reading Siddhartha and my first vision of the Buddha and the intuition of gold light and a footstep made for you that you're stepping into. Uh, the Christians call this a moment of grace. And for others, it can be listening to one Dhamma talk. Um, it can be one reading one phrase from a book. For Long Sumedho, he was on a Navy, uh, I think aircraft carrier, and read one page of, I think, Bhante Rahula's What the Buddha Taught and said, oh, I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> and not that it has to be Buddhism particularly 
for every person initially, but the pivot point of a life where suffering leads to faith and a search. The Buddha said that pain and stress and suffering lead to either bewilderment or a search. And what happens when that hope and spark of the search begins? And yes, there's a period of waiting, but also there's more than that. There's a sutta, which I don't think many people know, called the Sudatta Sutta, and it's about how Anattapindika, one of the foremost lay supporters in the Buddha's time, first encountered the Buddha. And it says he heard that the Buddha, the Blessed One, had come to town. His name was Sudatta at the time. And he went to, he fell asleep. He wanted to go visit, but he knew this is not the right time to visit the Blessed One in the evening. And he went to sleep with his mindfulness immersed in the Buddha, with his mindfulness directed towards the Buddha, and woke and there was a sense of light. And then he arose and walked out of the city. And as soon as he exited the city, fear and dread arose in him. And he dis darkness, light disappeared and darkness arose. And he decided to turn back. But then a yaka named Sivaka came, uh, sort of an, a Buddhist spirit that's sort of fierce, uh, uh, an ogre. but they are also good in some cases, arose and said, do not turn back, Sudatta. One sixteenth of a footstep forward is worth 10,000 elephants laden with gold, and so on. And so Sudatta turned back towards walking towards the Buddha, and light arose. And then darkness came again in fear and dread, and so on three times until finally he keeps on walking and he sees the Buddha walking meditation under the stars in a grove. And the Buddha sits down and says, come Sudatta, sit. And Sudatta, who hadn't, Anattapindika, who had never told the Buddha his name, they'd never met, said, the blessed one has called me by my name, by my given name. And faith arose and he sat. And there's so much in that story. Um, first, there's the sense that we're all sleeping, you know, and what does it mean to wake up when we hear this word of the Blessed One's teachings, of the Dhamma, of spiritual path. Then there's the fact that it wasn't quite the right time for him to go visit. There's the obstacles that come up, the fact that often, despite how deeply we feel drawn to these teachings, it's just different situations in our life don't allow ourselves to give ourselves to them as much as we want. But we're unable to go back to bed. We're unable to keep to going to go back to sleep. And so Anatta Pindika rises finally and walks out of the city, out of the domain of the known and of the world. But as soon as he exits that gate to the realm that others do not understand, that light disappears and darkness comes and fear comes. And three times he's turned back. And this is Mara, the uncanny fact, recognized pretty much across spiritual traditions, that when you turn your heart towards what is brighter and greater, often something will come, a force either internal um, or perhaps external, who knows, that will try to drive you back towards the known, towards what you're familiar with. But what urges Anattapindika on each time is this uh, yoga, or yaka, sivaka. And the fact that it takes an, a bit of an ogre, a bit of fierceness to push us through that space. I've known someone who says that you know a decision is right in your life if it upsets or confuses about half the people in your life. And Paulo Coelho said, look, when you're young, you know what you want. You know what your destiny is, and then you forget. But life is kind, and it gives you a second chance. And then you have one choice, which is either to pay the price of living your own story or to live someone else's, meaning your parents or your wife's or your husband's. And it's so true. So often in a young child or in your own youth, you know some arrow has been pointed straight at a target and you see it 
And then you do forget. And then in your 20s or 30s or maybe your 60s or 70s, life gives you the other chance. But there is a price to pay. There's always a price to pay. But this is what makes life sacred, is the ethic of sacrifice. And if you are willing to step into that unknown, Long Parpasana says that wisdom will take you to the edge, but faith is what lets you step off of the edge. Something like that. I, I mean, that implies a long drop, so I'm not sure if it's a total. Maybe like in Indiana Jones, where there's that invisible bridge. Um, but what pushes you? Are you willing to push past and to know that when difficulties manifest, it's not a sign that you're on the wrong path. Sometimes it's a sign that you're on the right one. If there's more resistance, if there's more things that come up, that means this is correct. That's Mara being really afraid that he's going to lose you from his grip. And then Anatta Pindaka meeting the Buddha, just walking meditation in this grove, and the Buddha calling him by his true name. And how often have you felt coming to these teachings that finally you've been called by your true name? When the Buddha teaches to someone who's not heard the Dhamma, they say it is wonderful, it is marvelous. It is as if, as if what has been turned over had been turned upright, as if what had been covered has been uncovered and revealed, as if you had lit, in, lit a lamp in a dark place for those with eyes to see forms. And in each of those cases, it's not an instance of knowing or finding out something new. It's of recognition of something you've known. You've intuited home and our lack of home for a long time. And then to finally feel its resonance again, to be called by your true name. But then what do you do when you step into this unknown and the world does not understand or validate. And I don't think people have to be as lost in this as we are because just as the Buddha laid down a form of vinya for the monastics, for the lay people, there was a form and it's called the upasaka form. It's white robed uh, lay men and lay women. And it's a thread stretching back 2,500 years, a form. And so how do you understand that from this place where you've become unmoored from the old patterns and constraints, how do you build a practice? How do you build a container that will hold you through the periods where things have become very difficult? And as soon as you practice, all this internal alchemy begins, but your heart can only take so much entropy. And so from those moments where you see clearly, where you see what it would mean to not dilute your life anymore, where you see what it means to live a life that would be worthy of your death, can you make determinations from that spot, from that place of clarity, to structure your path? And this is the form. So... The basics, of course, are the five precepts, not killing um, intentionally. And one can echo that out into buying and eating vegetarian and vegan, if possible. Expanding that compassion to a broader realm. Not stealing, not engaging in sexual misconduct, not lying, and not taking intoxicants. The Buddha said these are the roots the basis of a human life. When you break those five, you dig up the very roots of what it means to be human, the Buddha said. But then you can ripple those out. But to know that those five in and of themselves have the potential to completely transform a life. Gil Fronsdale talked about when he first encountered a commune. He's a, a well-known lay teacher. And Initially, their sacrament had been to take a bunch of acid together before the cops started catching them. And so they decided they had to find a sacrament equally as powerful as psychedelics. And what they settled on was honesty. What they settled on was honesty. And Gil said that that community was the most powerful one he'd ever been a part of. 
up until that point. And to hold that fourth precept of not lying, it takes real dedication, especially in a work environment. Um, there's supporters we know who, or know of, who, you know, he entered a career and just, that was one of his determinations. I will not be dishonest in this career. And initially he lost some business, but eventually he became known as someone who would not lie. And he was just fine, but it takes a real determination in a professional environment to keep that forth, but it is worth it. And then you can ripple that fourth precept out and determine to avoid slanderous speech, gossip, harsh speech, idle chatter. And this is important is as we practice the wording of evil and good, stop being as relevant. Most of us have given up most evil. But the metrics of trivial and non-trivial become viscerally important. You begin to feel when you're wasting your time, when the conversation has gone on too long, when it's about the same subject again, and it begins to be painful. <laughs> and to pay attention to that compass needle, and not necessarily to sort of run away from the conversation, but to steer by that, and to acknowledge that this will change how you interact with a lot of the relationships in your life. People have this experience of, you just don't feel like talking about the Seahawks game again, or about outdoor gear again. <laughs> For me, that was, I was on a, before I ordained, I was uh, backcountry skiing with my parents, and just, I remember a three-hour conversation with someone, not either of them, around REI gear, and I was just like, I just, I just can't take it. <laughs> um, so to really know that, but to know that cutting those relationships off also often doesn't feel right. So to be gentle, to move more into trying to find the Dharma heart of someone, to ask them questions, and to, I've advised this before, but feel free to batch those relationships and meetings. Instead of having five different coffee dates over two weeks, you know, just host a dinner once every two weeks where you invite all those friends at once and you feed them. And that resounding note of generosity will overwhelm all the other discordant chords that might be there. Just this is something that is neglected in practice circles today is hosting and feeding and hospitality. It is sacred. The Buddha said there are five objects of respect. Um, respect for the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, for the training, and for receiving guests. For receiving guests. And I love that he put that fifth there. As a young monk at Mopjan, where I ordained, I would be meditating and very serious. You know, my parents, I told this before, would call me and say, are you making any friends? And I said, I'm not here to make friends. <laughs> and, uh, and then in, my, in the midst of my deep, devoted practice, I was the guest monk and would learn that 20 Malaysian lay supporters had come for a week-long retreat without announcing it, and I had to find them all huts. And if it's just my practice and my, you know, my peace of mind, that's just suffering. But if you understand that practice can be that act of giving, of making people feel as welcome and cared for as you possibly can, it can be the most beautiful practice you could possibly take on. I benefited so much from being the one to find those 20 people, huts and oh, an accommodation. So are you hosting others? Are you feeding others at your house at least once every two weeks? I really would encourage it. Try to bring that into your life. And, you know, that fourth precept also of, of gossip. And this is the seduction, gossip. And can you steer away from it? Really, really putting that as a strong boundary. Um, and if you have the friend who just loves to gossip, you know, you can be subtle about it. You can say, look, I'm, you know, in a separate conversation, just say, look, I'm really trying to not gossip about people. Um, would you mind helping me with that? You know, call me on it if you see me gossiping. And maybe you don't mention that they're the real one that's gossiping all the time, but hopefully they can connect the dots in a gentle way. But that's quite a gift, and people will trust you so much more. So the five precepts, expanding the fifth into 
uh, entertainment, you know, avoiding those grosser forms, and then just building a schedule uh, into your day, into your week, into your month that will structure your life as a Buddhist. And what that can look like on a day-to-day -day basis is the first thing you wake up, bow to a Buddha image or whatever image contains for you that north star of awakening, of purity of heart. Dedicate your life towards the benefit of all beings towards, you know, for me, I say, may I be a servant of the Dhamma. Um, you can then begin your day with 28 full-length prostrations. There's a lot of us doing that. That's really fun. And just feel free to spontaneously pray during that. You're just setting intention. We don't believe in a supreme deity in Buddhism, but may my heart be pure. May I give up greed, hatred, and delusion. May I be kind. Begin your day with meditation. That's so important. Emphasize the morning practice always. You may not be, it may not be your best time of sitting. It doesn't matter. Get at least 20 minutes in, in the morning. That's basic hygiene, because it will change the whole tenor of your day. And if you can get 45 minutes in the morning, that's even better. I find there's sea changes in people's lives around 20 minutes of meditation a day, 45 minutes a day, and an hour and a half a day in two 45-minute sessions. Any of those are wonderful, but uh, you sort of have to work with your environment and your situation and if you have a three-year-old or not. <laughs> during your day, reorient during your lunch break. You know, we know people who've put signs on their door of their office saying meditating, and people think it's funny at first, but over time they respect it quite a lot. Reorient. Um, Tweri Sala, five minutes before every hour when she was working as an attorney, she'd reestablish mindfulness. You can set a little alarm. I think Max has one going for every 15 minutes. Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> so at Thich Nhat Hanh's monastery, they ring a bell regularly, and everyone just stops and breathes. I asked once what happened when the fire alarm went off. And they said that actually happened once, and everyone just kind of sat there for a while until they realized it wasn't the mindfulness bell. <laughs> Um, in the evening, meditate, set a, a bedtime where you pull back from social things so that you have a chance to meditate. Um, if that's a bit awkward to do, saying, look, I'm going to leave, then you can say, look, my teacher told me I have to get some meditation in the evening. So I'm telling you now, I can be your teacher just for now, get some meditation in the evening. So now you can blame it on the monk. It helps. Um, I've made a commitment to to kind of center. Every week on your weekly schedule, make sure you're getting an uposa today. That's a Buddhist Sabbath. Um, just where maybe from the afternoon on, you turn off the phone and reestablish your practice. And a difficulty with Sabbath days is people can try to just cut off all contact and just meditate alone or something. And that doesn't always work. It can be a bit dry. So to try to build a world of your Sabbath, of your uposa today, that allows practice to grow. So maybe that includes, maybe the morning is when you invite people over for that meal. And then maybe you go for a walk with a loved one or a Kali and Amitta spiritual friend in the afternoon. But that is when you get the longer period of practice, of meditation. It is when, if you want, you can hold the eight precepts where you don't wear makeup, you don't wear any adornments, you um, don't imbibe any entertainment. If you want, you can take the precept of not eating afternoon. That just keeps the mind and heart light in the evening and keeps you from getting entangled in dinner and all that that entails. And then not sleeping on higher luxurious beds, which can sound kind of trivial, but if you do sleep on a thermorest one day a week, you do notice when you wake up that things aren't like they usually are, and it's helpful. You know, and then once a month, can you, and we have a, you know, can you have a confession partner every two weeks or so? Can you kind of lay out what you wish you'd done better, what your hopes are for your own comportment? And then in Buddhist countries, there's three seasons, each four months. And when you're in this period of being moldable, when the old structures have fallen away, 
it can mean so much to step into a monastery for two or three or four days because often there's this quiet voice waiting in us. You know, there's a, in, in the Bible, there's such a beautiful verse um, about, in Kings 1, you know, the thunder came and God was not in the thunder. The lightning came and God was not in the lightning. The fire came and God was light, not, in the, not in the fire. And then there was a still, small voice. And that is that quiet intuition of Dhamma that sometimes it speaks with the voice of a lion, but so often, much more commonly, it's gentle and quiet. And that's why you have to have those spaces of silence in your day and your uposita once a week or once every two weeks where you get a chance to step back and listen. And then once every three months, can you make a bigger space, two or three days at a monastery if you can, or on retreat at least, to really let that voice rise in volume to make a resonating body for it. Bright, loud, and mobile is the false. Subtle and indistinct is the true. And I tell the story sometimes of, they did an experiment with Joshua Bell, the one of the most virtuoso violinists in the world. And Gene Weingarten, I think, was the journalist who did it. And he just played a, I think in Chicago, a concert in front of hundreds or thousands, charging enormous amounts for each ticket. And I think the Stradivarius he played on was a $100,000 Stradivarius. And they dressed him in normal clothes and put him in a, base, in a subway playing and busking. And there's a video of it. And you just see everyone passing, walking right by. And he looks like a ghost. Only the children are the ones that turn and try to stop. And their parents all sort of tug them on. And after a while, you realize that um, he's not the ghost. Everyone else is the ghost. And trust what you found here. You're hearing a music and a song that, that is rare and that the world does not validate or hear. And it's important, but the structure and the resonating body of that Stradivarius, finely tuned, carefully shaped, are essential for that note to ring out. We love to talk about the Dhamma and these high wisdom teachings. We so rarely talk about the restraint and the conduct and the discipline it takes to create a resonating space for that. But this is an essential part of the path is write out your determinations, write out that structure, make the sacrifices you need to make to carve the wood into that shape and come into communion with others who understand where that note can ring out even briefly even in a science classroom for you know sixth graders, all together so you can hear it again. And understand it's the most precious note you'll ever hear. So good luck, and may it continue to grow. Sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu Anumoda. Okay, two more little poem pieces um, worth quoting, I think, here. There's Mary Oliver, the art of dis no, Naomi Shihab Nye, the art of disappearing. When they ask, don't I know you, say no. When they invite you to a party, remember what parties are like before answering. <laughs> Greasy meatballs on a paper plate. Someone telling you in a loud voice how they wrote a poem once. It's not that you don't love them. It's that you're trying to remember something you've forgotten. Trees, the sound of a bell at dawn. When someone recognizes you in the supermarket, smile and then become a cabbage. <laughs> And then the other one, which I really love, and some of you have heard me quote it again, is The Journey by Mary Oliver. One day you finally knew what you had to do and began. 
though the voices around you continued to yell their bad advice and the wind pried with its fingers at the very foundations. Mend my life, each voice cried. But you didn't stop, though their melancholy was terrible. It was already late and a wild night and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But slowly, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds, and there was a new voice that you slowly recognized as your own that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life you could save. So I like that one. We have time for questions and uh, people can just raise their hand and we will somehow get a mic to you in the midst of this. And then uh, if you're on Zoom, feel free to raise your electronic hand and we can call on you too. And actually let's start with Zoom. Um, I can't see the name of the person. Kathy, please. Oh, just a second, we have to unmute you, Kathy. Go for it, Kathy. Thank you. Um, I uh, just Kathy, to share this. Um, can you hear me? We can. We can. Go for it. Okay. I just wanted to share this. Yesterday, I was at the Apple store, and um, I was paying, and um, the the woman taking my payment um, said, are you all done your Christmas shopping? And I, I have rather an adverse reaction to Christmas since I've been Buddhist. And I said, no, I don't do Christmas. I said, I... I don't, I, I can't remember exactly, but it wasn't very complimentary. And I said, I, I give my money to charity. I said, I think it's a waste to buy gifts. And uh, as soon as she heard I was Buddhist, she reacted quite pleasingly and was interested. And, and um, I, I can't remember, um, but I said, do you know I said, um, what, what region are you? She said, I was just so ha happy with her. I wanted to engage with her more, but she was incredibly busy. And I think she wanted to engage more too, but we kind of left it at that. So I just, you know, that was a really unexpected thing in this crazy madness of the Apple store. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, they call them Apple geniuses for a reason. So maybe she had, I'm glad she tuned into that. Steve. Um, thank you for this. Uh, <clears throat> I had an experience the other day, and there's something maybe you can give some uh, perspective. So we've, we've, we're in a relatively new neighborhood. We were invited to go to these neighbors. I sort of have this sort of association because she used to be a, she used to work in aerospace as a, and I used to be a journalist covering aerospace. But basically the entire evening was me and was five of us, was she and her husband, especially her, was just downloading about Boeing stories for like an hour and a half straight. And that was okay, you know, and I didn't care. I mean about the Boeing stories, but what I sensed was that somehow it was for her like the, I don't know how to say this, the non-concretization of the Dharma was unnerving, so she was trying to fill it with stuff. And she didn't know what to do, so she just kept telling stories about herself, never asked us a word about us, which is fine. But I just had a feeling, it was like somewhere in that dynamic, there was something to pay attention to, and how to be compassionate and kind and give her space to be herself, and if there's anything to share, share it, but maybe there's not, I don't know. You know, I wonder if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, no, this is, um, it's a fascinating realm to try to become skillful at navigating those kind of interactions. And, um, you know, I'd say one thing is right speech can almost always manifest as questions. It's very common to meet kind people. It's very rare to meet curious people. And if you can steer that, like, okay, the floodgates are open, um, on her, you know, can you 
though can you be precise in inserting well-timed questions, kind of, for me, it really becomes a beautiful game of like, can I find someone's, can I find someone's four noble truths? You know, like what is, you don't have to steer right to their suffering, but like what gives them joy? What kind of gives them, <laughs> what, what gives them, you know, happiness? And, and sometimes it's just like, you know, sometimes maybe it is just letting them kind of talk about something, but, but often there are moments where you can insert your self and steer it. Other times I think a much more um, structured approach is necessary for group conversations where you really just kind of go out there and say, actually, I found this is a really effective thing. And this is what we do in most Clear Mountain interactions is we say, you know, could everyone go around and just kind of share what's been coming up for them this last week? It's simple, it's beautiful, it, it sanctifies the space very quickly. Might make things awkward sometimes, but pretty consistently it's okay. Um, so I'd say there is time for that. Um, there's other times, uh, you know, my dad was at a family gathering and politics came up and he just went down and laid down by the dog. And sometimes there's times to just go lay down by the family dog. <laughs> um, so that's part of it, but I, I would say that you know, and then there's times where you just really disengage and and you do know the limits of how, how much you want to be there. And it's a little hard to do skillfully, but you can always schedule those interactions to have a a phone call at the end of it that you can say, I have to go to get a phone call or something, you know, skillful. So, yeah, no, good. Yeah, can we have a, f please? Because the one thing that did come up in that that was actually interesting is, I don't know, Alan Mulally, that rings a bell, he was a former CEO of Boeing Commercial Airplanes, mm. became the CEO of Ford and saved it during the Great Recession. Yes. Just a brilliant, incredible person. And when I was doing that, I was I, I brought up to her, mm. I suddenly saw an opening. I said, oh, Alan Mulally, I got a great story about Alan. And she was, oh, what, what was that? <laughs> and then, because when I went on uh, retreat one time, I was about to go on a several month retreat, mm. and I talked to, I did an interview just before that, and he asked me questions. Like he asked me the most yeah. probing questions about what was gonna happen in the retreat, how would it be different, what would be hard, what yeah. would be easy, he even, he even pushed off the, other people coming in the office for 15 minutes so it could grill me. Yes. And I told her that, and she went, oh. And that was a, like a bridge. That was very interesting. Yeah, no, that's really good. And, and being skillful, I mean, the Buddhist word for, we use the word kusala a lot, skillful. And you know, most of it, most of you know it's etymologically from the word for kusa grass, which cuts you if you grab it wrong. So you have to be very skillful in grabbing the kusa grass. But it is a developed skill, like how do you steer those conversations and this aspect of um, upeka, um, equipoise or equanimity, um, the little translation is upa, which means to approach, and ik, which means to look. So it's looking closely. And I've talked about this before, but when you're faced with kind of a swirl of sankara, like patterns and speech, um, usually for me it's, you know, with certain family dynamics, not my parents, they're great. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's strange having your parents right here. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> all right. but I know that a lot of the job with situations like that is just to watch closely and stay out of the tangle. And if you do that, there are almost always little cracks where you can go in right at the right moment, but you have to be a bit like a samurai just waiting to, to get in there. So yeah, samurai analogies, okay. so. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, yeah, Zoom, please. Arnold. Yes, um, I enjoyed the, the meditation. Uh, we just had a question on the visualization on the breathing. And so in the out breath, um, when, it, uh, when, when visualizing the, the energy like coming down the spine through the sacrum, do you visualize it going through the legs, your legs into the ground, or do you just visualize it just going straight, like through the air into the ground? Mm. Good question. Just curious. <laughs> Usually I sit cross-legged or in the kneeling style. So for me in that case, is it just goes straight down through the tailbone um, and sort of avoids the whole legs. If you're sitting in a chair, you might have to experiment with that one. I haven't done the chair thing very often. 
Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it's really useful if you are resonating with that way of working with the breath. It's really worth looking into the Chinese conception of how the breath energy moves because it's an unbelievably detailed map. There's a book called The Way of Energy, which I think is used by a lot of monastics. Um, but yeah, and with Kundalini as well, but there's the central axis, which the breath goes on. And specifically in Taoist circles, there's something called the microcosmic orbit, which runs up the spine, over the top of the head and down. And initially you won't be able to feel it, but as you practice, you really might begin to notice that if you kind of encourage that up and down perception, either just up and down the central axis, or you can try the kind of full circle you might notice that actually it's aligning with, with how some element of the energy actually moves. So yeah, um, sometimes honestly, as the mind gets calmer, the up and down doesn't go as deep into the ground for me and it might just end at the tailbone or then after a while maybe you're just coming up to the top of the head and down to about the, the navel. So you kind of have to let your mind lead you a little bit on that in terms of what feels good. Does that help at all, Arnold? Yeah, it it it, re it did actually remind me of uh, qigong practice and like a tree pose. So I was kind of yes, yes. envisioning my, myself as being like, like a tree kind of thing. Yeah, I guess that'd be so much for uh, clarifying that. <laughs> No, no, that's, uh, I think that's a great visualization. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Scott. Uh, oh, uh, may I just ask a, yep. a question? Um, how, i just curious your response to the, you suggested some very skillful practices that we as lay people can do 20 minutes, maybe 45, twice a day, um, the precept. At least in my experience, sometimes I will find that I'm falling, quote, short. And then the inner voice in my head goes, oh, and then it's kind of all or nothing. Ah, well, I can't do that. So it's sometimes there are days when the only mindfulness I can achieve is walking and just savoring, you know, the trees blowing for, for three seconds. Um, so how do, you, um, how do you advise dealing with that sort of resistance conflict issue? No. Great question. Um, you know, I think it's also relevant that in that story of Anattapindika, he turns back and forth three times. Like, we spend a lot of time at the threshold. Um, and I'm a big fan of learning through contrast. So, you know, you do jump into practice and really give yourself to it. And then things get busy or you get a little bit lazy or something happens and you're doing it less. And I think that's just very natural. Um, and just feeling the difference in quality of mind if you're getting 20 minutes of meditation in the morning versus not. Like after a while, you're like, how do I, it just feels like you didn't take the trash out. It's, it's really painful. Um, and yeah, the self-flagellation and self-criticism, which is so endemic to our culture, can really come to bear there. Um, so I'd say, yeah, be patient. Um, if there's a sense of violence, that's not good. And, and and that can get in there of like, all right, doubling down, I'm really gonna get this. And there's, you just feel like that click of just, it's a different motion of the heart. And for me, it, it really rings of dukkha in a non good way. It's, it's not kind of a gentle, a good word is diligent effortlessness. But part of that is building those structures which hold you through that. And then one thing I think is undervalued is often you only have so much wiggle room in a day-to-day -day schedule. And you do find like you just can't, you can't get an hour and a half of meditation. I'm sorry, Nisipo, like <laughs> um, I've got a kid or a job or other things. Um, that's fine. What I think people undervalue is the ability to batch your practice. So maybe you can like get 20 minutes a day, but one day a week, can you arrange things? Can you get a friend to take care of the kids so that you get that afternoon or at least a few hours? and that can make all the difference. Like that's usually where the wiggle room is that people don't see is like every two weeks or every week, can you batch that time? And then three times a year, three times a year, can you get two or three days, four days, however long to really reorient and that'll put you in good stead. Yeah, does that help? Okay. Uh, Scott or someone, that guy. <laughs> 
um, I had a question kind of along these lines of meditation and um, not here, but when I'm when I'm meditating alone, I often find that I have a soundtrack going on in my head, and um, I'm doing all the practice. I'm focusing on the, a different practice, like the nose or the the traveling around. But in the background, you know, I have you know Grateful Dead going, or you know Iron Maiden, or whatever, whatever, <laughs> whatever. As there is, can you comment about what to do about that, or should I be thinking about that, or is that just comment about that, please? Yeah. Anyone else have this problem? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, Ajahn Amro talks about a retreat where he went through the entire soundtrack of Oklahoma. <laughs> this is, by the way, the best answer when people are like, you monks can't listen to music? I mean, and just like, have you tried to meditate with a soundtrack? And so that's honestly one thing is to pull back from music a little bit. Um, I know that's triggering people. Music, it can be OK, but it does get stuck in your head. Um, um, also, I'm not sure what to say about the Grateful Dead versus Iron Maiden distinction there. Um, <laughs> uh, but one useful thing is, you know, monastics, we have more, we have somewhat musical elements. And one beautiful thing to note is in the suttas, the angels, the devas, always speak in verse, in song, basically. It's, it's kind of profound. That's an under, people don't note that enough. Um, but to first look on YouTube for Green Tara Mantra or Omane Padme Om or the Buddha's words on loving kindness, Karani Ametta. And there's kind of these musical versions of that um, that fulfill that need in the heart for a soundtrack and can kind of overwhelm the other soundtrack. So that's really helpful. And then. Um, there's suttas you can really begin to memorize. This is one element of a really good Buddhist life as well, if you want, is the Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta, um, the discourse in the first turning of wheel of Dhamma. It's very musical. I mean, simple, but very beautiful. And you can find that on Amravati's website, the recording, and it's in book volume two. Um, but yeah, for to counteract stimulus like that, if you're still listening to some music, you do need to bring in some counteractive stimulus. You can't fight that with just silence, usually. So, yeah. What time is it? I can't find my clock, which I keep looking. Ah, I found it. OK. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, please. Yes. One more. Thank, thank you, Ajahn. Um, so I, I really appreciate our practical your 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 talk was today and and related to practice and and, and I get a lot out of that to uh, may, maybe bring it back to one of those bigger questions we love to talk about something I've been think, thinking about a lot is I, I hear different very different perspectives on whether or not um, in in this day and age people can can achieve you know our hauntship. And uh, you know, one school of thought I hear is like, you know, that doesn't happen anymore, and and it can't happen anymore. And then I'm I'm also going through Ajahn Man's autobiography uh, right now, and it has a very a different um, perspective on that. And and I, I was I was hoping you could talk about that a little bit and how you think about it. Oh yeah, no, I, I'd actually almost given the talk on the stages of enlightenment today, and maybe in the next few weeks again. Um, yeah, it's possible. People are attaining. Um, I, I feel very confident in that. Um, going to Thailand, it was something to meet some of those teachers who I, I feel have attained. Um, I think a bigger question which does touch people is, OK, how about for the Westerners, you know, for us with our particular neuroses and, you know, uh, Judeo-Christian conditioning and all that. And I'd say that I feel I know um, several lay people, actually, who have at least stream entry, which is the first level of enlightenment. Um, and you know, you hear about these four levels of enlightenment. It can feel like this strange esoteric le leveling system. But what it is is it's the first three fetters of attachment to rites and rituals, identity view, and um, doubt that are abandoned in that first glimpse of an awakening, those are your cultural conditioning. Everything you've gotten since you were a kid, your name, your gender identification, all that stuff. 
what you let go of at the third stage of anagami, non-returner, is the biological conditioning, greed and aversion, the desire to feed off of something or run away in the physical form. And then arahantship, full enlightenment, abandons the five ending fetters, which are all to do with the mind. So it's this scraping away of these different levels of conditioning. Um, and stream entry, I think, is, is, is possible for, for lay people. Um, and when Ajahn Shah was asked about this, he was very clear about not getting caught in, caught in it. And to know that so often in Western circles, we just have this one metric of like meditation, enlightenment, jhana. In healthy Buddhist cultures, they always give a lot of attention to the 10 paramis or spiritual perfections, dhana, giving, patient endurance, equanimity, truthfulness, determination, love. And that's so helpful because a good Buddhist life, meditation's part of it, but there's these other much you know, profound spiritual qualities in the heart that are also growing. And if you're not valuing those and late, you know, naming them, you cannot realize that your heart has changed radically. Um, and yeah, I've seen the difference between the path of just someone going on a lot of retreat alone versus living in community and giving. And, and honestly, it's so beautiful to see the one who's le lived that kind of holistic Buddhist life. So yes, it's possible. Don't get hung up on it. Yeah. Okay, now we have to wrap up, I think. That was a fun ending question, though. I do have stories. There's some fun stories. Um, yeah, there's a Mechi in Thailand who I think was a second life stream enterer, which I've almost never heard about. So another time.